It's hard to believe it's been over four years since I started co reading comic books again with the Arkham City miniseries by Paul Dini that, of course, led up to the epic video game Batman Arkham City. And that was also conveniently the same year when the New 52 started, and a lot of people were going completely crazy over it because DC was rebooting and stuff. But back then, I didn't know these people. I didn't know the whole comic book industry community thing. I was just newcomer getting into things and if there's one book that's always been kind of like my multi-year companion in the comic book industry it's basically scott snyder's batman it's kind of like the walking dead of my comics reading career i suppose it's just been like this thing that's always been a companion to mine throughout the years you know through the good through the bad and I cannot, I can't really say that I'm ever going to be able to be completely, uh, completely 100% objective about this run because it's just the first really great comic book that I read. It's been a really great comic book for the past four years, and this, the particular arc I'm going to be reviewing today, Endgame, is a clear evidence of that. Um, Endgame, for all intents and purposes, is pretty much a sequel to Death of the Family. And this was supposed to be the end of Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's whole run on Batman. This is where they were going to end all the whole thing and then move on to other projects. But DC was like, here's a shitload of money. And then they were like, cool, bro. And now they're still doing Batman. And they're still going to be doing Batman for the foreseeable future. Which, like, some people are going to th think it's bad idea even i was up was uh, skeptical about the whole mecca gordon batman thing but uh, two issues in i'm really enjoying it i think it's a pretty cool direction and it's going to be and it's already been used to really good effect in stuff like uh the batgirl series and even batman and superman um but anyway going back to endgame this is as i said before a sequel to death of the family and that storyline, Joker comes back after being gone for a year, both in comic book time and in real time, after his face was cut off by the doll maker in uh, Detective Comics number one in the New 52 relaunch. So during that year, we didn't see or hear anything about the Joker. His slashed off face made a couple of appearances here and there, but we really didn't get anything from the character for a really long time. And then when he came back, Joker pretty much gave Batman kind of an ultimatum. He said that, uh, look, bro, I love you, man, uh, and I really love this whole thing you and me got together. I think it's really awesome, but these partners of yours, this this Robin and Red Robin and Red Hood and, and Nightwing and Batgirl, like, dude, these guys are slowing you down, bro. When you were on your own, you were like the man. You could do like a billion things by yourself, and you got all these people making you weak and soft and making it too predictable, bro, so here's what I'm gonna do, man. I'm gonna fucking kill your entire family. That way, just you and me, bro. You and me can be best buds forever, man. Sound good? Sound good. And then Batman throws him off a fucking cliff in the Batcave, and then Joker was gone again for another year and a half, which was still pretty impressive, restraint on DC's part. But now Joker is back, and this time, like any spurned lover, he is out for revenge. And if Grant Morrison set up the whole thing where Batman is basically the Bat God, he is the only person who can ever be this kind of Batman and still function as he does. You know, he is the only kind of man who can... Uh, endure the trauma, the tragedy, the the, the heartaches, the, the everything, the, the difficult life of Batman, Bruce Wayne is the only guy who can really do that. And he is, for all intents and purposes, the Bat God. But here, this is, jo this is where Joker really takes it to the next level himself, where he becomes the Joker God. And Joker has always been kind of a character who seemed to be very, very capable of of doing things he shouldn't be able to do, but he, but he can, yet he chooses not to because he wants to keep the game up between himself and Batman. And here we get a storyline where Joker really shows the full scale of his capabilities. He is not holding back. He is not joking. He is interested in ending this with Batman once and for all. He thinks Batman has become boring. 
He doesn't want to do this game with him anymore. He wants to move on to find someone else who can maybe entertain him, and he intends to finish off their whole little game with in a gigantic blaze of jokerized glory. And immediately the story sets itself up by having Batman fight most of the Justice League in the first couple of issues. Now, a lot of people accuse this of this just being Scott Snyder, you know, jerking off the Batman because, you know, Batman can ask fuck Superman to the moon and he, and he, and he gives you Batman and Dark Knight Returns and Frank Miller and, and, and the Bat-tards all orgasmed. Everyone with a sensible mind was like, I don't think he's doing that. And then everyone who's a fan of the other characters was like, ah, oh, fuck you, Scott Snyder. Um, but but, but the, the whole battle with the Justice League in the beginning of the storyline... It, it feels necessary, and it really sets up the mood of the story because it shows you what Joker is truly capable of. Because this is a guy who has, ever since Grant Morrison run, he has known that Bruce Wayne is Batman. And it is heavily implied that he has always known that, but he has chosen not to do anything with it because he wants to keep the game up. But we have a Joker here who's done with the game, and he just wants to get it over with. So now we really see that this guy, if he just went completely balls out, I'm going to annihilate you. Right from day one, he easily could have, because he takes over the freaking Justice League here. And it fits thematically, because Joker becomes the Joker God, as I said here before. He escalates... He escalates to a level that is even beyond Bat God in certain respects. Like this is really the straight line where he becomes this almost real force of nature that a lot of different writers have interpreted him as in uh, a lot of different versions. But this is really the one where we see the most practical application of Joker being a force of nature, and he basically transforms the whole Justice League into Jokerized, you know, crazy people, and six them on Batman, and not even Batman, like Bruce Wayne, and that immediately shows you just how far Joker is willing to take it if the opening act of his final uh, game with Batman is him sicking the Justice League on him like a pack of mad dogs, and uh, the whole storyline continues on uh, very much like this, where Joker is constantly doing new things to screw over Batman. He is constantly one-upping himself. He's constantly making Batman zigzag around what he's doing, but Batman can never really get a good read on him. And he and the and the hero of the storyline is always just a, a little slip away from being completely destroyed and and failing his mission. And Joker very nearly does it at the end of the storyline, which further drives the point home that this guy, when he is out for your blood, he is really out for your fucking blood. And the whole concept of an entire city full of Jokerized people isn't something new. Grant Morrison, once again, a lot of Grant Morrison <laughs> mentions here, but it's unavoidable because there are a lot of parallels between the Snyder run and the Morrison run, which I plan to do a video about, uh, you know, what are the differences, who I like more, and that kind of stuff, but I'm going to get to that later. Anyway, this is not something, this is something Morrison also did in an issue of Batman Inc., where he had a whole issue devoted to Damien as Batman, filled in a Jokerized city, Gotham City, to be exact, where everyone was turned into, into these Jokerized crazy people who just want to murder Batman. And we have a very similar situation here, where the entire population has been transformed. And it is so, so fucking creepy. Just the idea of being stuck in a city with these insane, laughing, creepy-voiced people just all out to kill you and maw you and do all, all sorts of horrible things to you. It's kind of like... It's kind of like Crossed, except... <laughs> Except uh, it's nowhere near as bloody as Crossed, uh, but but it's very similar. It's it's very very similar in premise. If you've read you know the Cross comic book, you're immediately gonna make that connection. And just this the whole concept of like Crossed with the Joker in Gotham City, which is already like this horrible shithole. It's absolutely terrifying. And the Joker really proves himself to be even crazier and even more terrifying than ever before. Because in Death of the Family, he has this kind of throwaway line while he's massacring Jim Gordon's partners and, you know, final cops and stuff in the GCPD in, like, the middle of the night, like, the power is turned off and, and you only see Gordon's, like, you know, completely brick-shitting face while he's listening to all his friends get slashed and stuff. And Joker tells him, 
Um, sometimes, Gordo, I just spend little hours in the night listening to you sleep at night, listening to you breathe. And, and, and the expression Gordon puts on, it's like, it's absolutely a horrified look on his face. And then later on in this storyline, Gordon um, checks out the, the history of a hospital that has a very bad reputation, lots of accidents, lots of deaths, lots of very creepy, mysterious ongoings happening there. And he sees in the photo from the 1920s, he sees the Joker. He sees him in like looking out the window and smiling at the people in, in the photo of this like big gas tragedy that killed like 20 people in the hospital and there he is and he's smiling and Gordon just his jaw hits the ground he drops his cigar and then he like immediately starts googling to figure out what the fuck is going on and then he goes to another photo of the same hospital from the 1940s the Joker is there and then he goes to another one from like the 60s and 70s Joker is there again and then he goes to a photo of Barbara and James Gordon Jr who went to that same hospital to get their tonsils removed, and he sees the Joker's hand creeping out the fucking door of where they're just casually, like, playing and having fun as little kids. And it's so, so creepy, and it's so awesome. But then, the ultimate payoff... N you know what? I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna say it. The ultimate payoff is too, too awesome for words to describe. I don't want to ruin it, but trust me, when you read that shit with, uh, after uh, remembering everything that happened to death of family, uh, you're going to be, you're going to be shitting your pants. Trust me. Like there were several times where I was reading this, like in the middle of the night, a couple of days ago. And I was like looking over my shoulder, genuinely scared. And I don't really do that much. Maybe it's because I don't really partake in like horror fiction that often. But usually when the effective horror fiction really gets to me, it usually works. And this really, really worked on several levels. Um, what else can I say without spoiling too much of the storyline? Um, basically, the whole plot is, like I said, Joker releases a virus that turns everyone into a lunatic, and Batman has to deal with that. And the Batman we get here is an older version of the Zero Year Batman, which I really, really like, and I think it works especially well um it's it's really interesting and good and so kind of different like subtly different from standard batman that snyder wrote in court of the owls and death of the family that i kind of wish that mecha gordon <laughs> wasn't a thing just so i can get more of this guy because the batman in zero year is like this kind of uh, punk rock batman like he he smiles a lot more often than you think he would he's kind of got like this brash attitude about him um, in fact, the very first thing you see of Batman in the storyline is him in the smoke in broad daylight in this big-ass mecha suit, and he's like, oh, you think you can come to my city and fuck with me? Well, screw you, boy. Then he pounds his chest, and he's like, welcome to Gotham, boy. And then he starts fighting the Justice League. Um, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, and the accent I probably used for him was awful, but that's pretty much Batman's introduction. It's like the most un batman -y type of introduction you can think of. And throughout the whole storyline, um, he never really feels like as much of a dick as he does in kind of Core of the Owls and uh, Death of the Family. He feels professional, but he doesn't feel like an asshole or a hard ass. Um, he has a couple of really cool interactions with Alfred and Julia. And his final confrontation with the Joker at the end, awesome. Love it. It's the most brutal fight I've ever seen the two of them have. But I think it's absolutely fitting, and it's... It's really some visceral shit. It, it, it is far more brutal than their final confrontation, The Dark Knight Returns, as far as I'm concerned, and I don't think I would get a lot of people who would disagree with me on that. Um, it's, in fact, it, it, the final confrontation is actually so good, it almost makes me wish these two never fight again in the comic books, but we know they will, and I'm sure other writers in the future are going to find interesting ways to do it. But this, but if this was the last time either of these guys ever met, saw each other, or fought, I would be absolutely fine with it. It was really, really that good. Uh, finally, we have the art, an aspect I usually don't talk about, but I think that Capullo, um, I think that the Capullo, for the most part, really knocked it out of the park, especially with the last fight with the Joker. 
I do have a problem with the way he draws the Justice League. I think he draws a great Superman. Um, he kind of draws him with like the smaller cape, kind of like an all-star Superman. And uh, he doesn't really give Superman too many lines, I don't feel. And when he does like psycho joker Superman, I think it's absolutely horrifying. Especially after he gets punched in the face and he has like this blood smear on his over his lips that looks like the Joker smile. And I think that was just fantastic. Um, his flash is really bad. Like, the lightning bolts are really, really pronounced, and they look horrendous. Um, Francis Manipul does the lightning bolts the best because whenever he runs, like, from, from the New 52 cracks, you know, from between the armor pieces, like, they glow, like, electricity comes out of it. But when there's not any electricity coming out of it, like, the cracks are very, very faint. Here, they're really pronounced, and they look really bad. Um, Aquaman has, like, this weird nose, but he doesn't really appear that much, so I don't think it's kind of a problem. If there's any, probably Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman has pretty much Bruce Wayne's face if he was a chick. And that's kind of distracting, and that's kind of like a problem with Capullo's art. Th throughout the whole run, it's that he just makes the m the males and females look too similar in the facial structure type deal. So yeah, that was a little distracting. But when he does, you know, the more horror based aspects, you know, you know, Batman going through a Joker I City, or him, or or the whole stuff with Gordon and the photos, or the final battle between Joker and the Batman. I think all that stuff is executed masterfully, and I, I don't know if this is my favorite art of his, because uh, because I still think his art in Zero Year was really, really cool, but I think that might have been because of the colorist. You know, Zero Year had a lot of really bright, really experimental colors that, re that set them apart from the darker, drearier stuff from before. Here, this is kind of a return to the more Death of the Family, Core of the Owls aesthetic. Um, so yeah, not entirely sure where would I rank it, but I, but if I had to like say that off the top of my head, I'd say his earlier art was the best, and this is a very, very close second. It would probably be better if it wasn't for the kind of iffy takes on the Justice League. Um, so yeah, Batman Endgame. I highly, highly recommend that you guys check this out. I think this is a fantastic, you know, big Batman story that's not necessarily an event. Um, I think it does an expert job of building off of what Snyder and Morrison and several other writers from beforehand did with both characters. And I think that if you just stop reading Scott Snyder's run right now, like if you don't care about Mecha Gordon or the stuff that's going to be happening later on, you just want to stop reading Snyder here, where the, where Snyder intended to end his run, I think you would still be in for a fantastic romp. And I think the ending is one of the most beautifully ironic things I've seen in the Batman mythos. So yeah, Batman Endgame. Check it out. I think it's really one of the best... Uh, storylines the characters had, which is saying a lot because he's had a lot of really good storylines recently. So yeah, check it out if you're in for some good Batman and Joker stuff.